When you become one with Buddha, one with everything that exists, you find the true meaning of being. When you forget all your dualistic ideas, everything becomes your teacher, and everything can be the object of worship. When everything exists within your big mind, all dualistic relationships drop away. There is no distinction between heaven and earth, man and woman, teacher and disciple. Sometimes a man bows to a woman. Sometimes a woman bows to a man. Sometimes the disciple bows to the master. Sometimes the master bows to the disciple. A master who cannot bow to his disciple cannot bow to Buddha. Sometimes the master and disciple bow together to Buddha. Sometimes we may bow to cats and dogs. In your big mind, everything has the same value. Everything is Buddha himself. You see something or hear a sound, and there you have everything, just as it is. In your practice, you should accept everything as it is, giving to each thing the same respect given to a Buddha. Here there is Buddhahood. Then Buddha bows to Buddha, and you bow to yourself. This is the true bow. If you do not have this firm conviction of big mind in your practice, your bow will be dualistic. When you are just yourself, you bow to yourself in its true sense, and you are one with everything. Only when you are you yourself can you bow to everything in its true sense. Bowing is a very serious practice. You should be prepared to bow even in your last moment. When you cannot do anything except bow, you should do it. This kind of conviction is necessary. Bow with this spirit, and all the precepts, all the teachings are yours, and you will possess everything within your big mind. Senno Rikyu, the founder of the Japanese tea ceremony, committed haraki, ritual suicide by disembowelment, in 1591 at the order of his lord, Hideyoshi. Just before Rikyu took his own life, he said, When I have this sword, there is no Buddha and no patriarchs. He meant that when we have the sword of big mind, there is no dualistic world. The only thing which exists is this spirit. This kind of imperturbable spirit was always present in Rikyu's tea ceremony. He never did anything in just a dualistic way. He was ready to die in each moment. In ceremony after ceremony, he died, and he renewed himself. This is the spirit of the tea ceremony. This is how we bow. My teacher had a callus on his forehead from bowing. He knew he was an obstinate, stubborn fellow, and so he bowed and bowed and bowed. The reason he bowed was that inside himself he always heard his master's scolding voice. He had joined the Soto order when he was 30, which for a Japanese priest is rather late. When we are young we are less stubborn, and it is easier to get rid of our selfishness. So his master always called my teacher you lately joined fellow, and scolded him for joining so late. Actually, his master loved him for his stubborn character. When my teacher was 70, he said, When I was young, I was like a tiger. But now, I'm like a cat. He was very pleased to be like a cat. Bowing helps to eliminate our self-centered ideas. This is not so easy. It is difficult to get rid of these ideas, and bowing is a very valuable practice. The result is not the point. It is the effort to improve ourselves that is valuable. There is no end to this practice. Each bow expresses one of the four Buddhist vows. These vows are, although sentient beings are innumerable, we bow to save them. Although our evil desires are limitless, we vow to be rid of them. Although the teaching is limitless, 
we vow to learn it all. Although Buddhism is unattainable, we vow to attain it. If it is unattainable, how can we attain it? But we should. That is Buddhism. To think, because it is possible, we will do it, is not Buddhism. Even though it is impossible, we have to do it because our true nature wants us to. But actually, whether or not it is possible is not the point. If it is our inmost desire to get rid of our self-centered ideas, we have to do it. When we make this effort, our inmost desire is appeased and nirvana is there. Before you determine to do it, you have difficulty. But once you start to do it, you have none. Your effort appeases your inmost desire. There is no other way to attain calmness. Calmness of mind does not mean you should stop your activity. Real calmness should be found in activity itself. We say it is easy to have calmness in inactivity. It is hard to have calmness in activity. But calmness in activity is true calmness. After you have practiced for a while, you will realize that it is not possible to make rapid, extraordinary progress. Even though you try very hard, the progress you make is always little by little. It is not like going out in a shower in which you know when you get wet. In a fog, you do not know you are getting wet. But as you keep walking, you get wet little by little. If your mind has ideas of progress, you may say, Oh, this pace is terrible. But actually, it is not. When you get wet in a fog, it is very difficult to dry yourself. So there is no need to worry about progress. It is like studying a foreign language. You cannot do it all of a sudden, but by repeating it over and over, you will master it. This is the Soto way of practice. We can say, either that we make progress little by little, or that we do not even expect to make progress. Just to be sincere and make our full effort in each moment is enough. There is no nirvana outside our practice. Nothing special. I do not feel like speaking after Zazen. I feel the practice of Zazen is enough. But if I must say something, I think I would like to talk about how wonderful it is to practice Zazen. Our purpose is just to keep this practice forever. This practice started from beginningless time, and it will continue into an endless future. Strictly speaking, for a human being, there is no other practice than this practice. There is no other way of life than this way of life. Zen practice is the direct expression of our true nature. Of course, whatever we do is the expression of our true nature. But without this practice, it is difficult to realize. It is our human nature to be active, and the nature of every existence. As long as we are alive, we are always doing something. But as long as you think, I am doing this, or I have to do this, or I must obtain something special, you are actually not doing anything. When you give up, when you no longer want something, or when you do not try to do anything special, then you do something. When there is no gaining idea in what you do, then you do something. In Zazen, what you are doing is not for the sake of anything. You may feel as if you were doing something special, but actually it is only the expression of your true nature. It is the activity which appeases your inmost desire. But as long as you think you are practicing Zazen for the sake of something, that is not true practice. If you continue this simple practice every day, you will obtain a wonderful power. Before you attain it, it is something wonderful. But after you obtain it, it is nothing special. It is just you, yourself, nothing special. As a Chinese poem says, I went and I returned. It was nothing special. Rosan, famous for its misty mountains, Seko for its water.
People think it must be wonderful to see the famous range of mountains covered by mists and the water said to cover all the earth. But if you go there, you will just see water and mountains, nothing special. It is a kind of mystery that for people who have no experience of enlightenment, enlightenment is something wonderful. But if they attain it, it is nothing. But yet it is not nothing. Do you understand? For a mother with children, having children is nothing special. That is Zazen. So if you continue this practice, more and more you will acquire something. Nothing special, but nevertheless something. You may say universal nature, or Buddha nature, or enlightenment. You may call it by many names, but for the person who has it, it is nothing, and it is something. When we express our true nature, we are human beings. When we do not, we do not know what we are. We are not an animal because we walk on two legs. We are something different from an animal, but what are we? We may be a ghost. We do not know what to call ourselves. Such a creature does not actually exist. It is a delusion. We are not a human being anymore, but we do exist. When Zen is not Zen, nothing exists. Intellectually, my talk makes no sense. But if you have experienced true practice, you will understand what I mean. If something exists, it has its own true nature, its Buddha nature. In the Parinirvana Sutra, Buddha says, everything has Buddha nature. But Dogen reads it in this way. Everything is Buddha nature. There is a difference. If you say everything has Buddha nature, it means Buddha nature is in each existence. So Buddha nature and each existence are different. But when you say everything is Buddha nature, it means everything is Buddha nature itself. When there is no Buddha nature, there is nothing at all. Something apart from Buddha nature is just a delusion. It may exist in your mind, but such things actually do not exist. So, to be a human being is to be a Buddha. Buddha nature is just another name for human nature, our true human nature. Thus, even though you do not do anything, you are actually doing something. You are expressing yourself. You are expressing your true nature. Your eyes will express, your voice will express, your demeanor will express. The most important thing is to express your true nature in the simplest, most adequate way and to appreciate it in the smallest existence. While you are continuing this practice, week after week, year after year, your experience will become deeper and deeper, and your experience will cover everything you do in your everyday life. The most important thing is to forget all gaining ideas, all dualistic ideas. In other words, just practice Zazen in a certain posture. Do not think about anything. Just remain on your cushion without expecting anything. And eventually, you will resume your own true nature. That is to say, your own true nature resumes itself. Part 2. Right Attitude Single-Minded Way The purpose of my talk is not to give you some intellectual understanding, but just to express my appreciation of our Zen practice. To be able to sit with you in Zazen is very, very unusual. Of course, whatever we do is unusual because our life itself is so unusual. Buddha said, to appreciate your human life is as rare as soil on your fingernail. You know, dirt hardly ever sticks on your nail. Our human life is rare and wonderful. When I sit, I want to remain sitting forever. But I encourage myself to have another practice. For instance, to recite the sutra or to bow. 
And when I bow, I think, this is wonderful. But I have to change my practice again to recite the sutra. So the purpose of my talk is to express my appreciation. That is all. Our way is not to sit to acquire something. It is to express our true nature. That is our practice. If you want to express yourself, your true nature, there should be some natural and appropriate way of expression. Even swaying right and left as you sit down or get up from zazen is an expression of yourself. It is not preparation for practice or relaxation after practice. It is part of the practice. So we should not do it as if it were preparing for something else. This should be true in your everyday life. To cook or to fix some food is not preparation. According to Dogen, it is practice. To cook is not just to prepare food for someone or for yourself. It is to express your sincerity. So when you cook, you should express yourself in your activity in the kitchen. You should allow yourself plenty of time you should work on it with nothing in your mind and without expecting anything. You should just cook. That is also an expression of our sincerity, part of our practice. It is necessary to sit in zazen in this way, but sitting is not our only way. Whatever you do, it should be an expression of the same deep activity. You should appreciate what we are doing. There is no preparation for something else. The Bodhisattva's way is called the single-minded way, or one railway track thousands of miles long. The railway track is always the same. If it were to become wider or narrower, it would be disastrous. Wherever you go, the railway track is always the same. That is the Bodhisattva's way. So even if the sun were to rise from the west, the Bodhisattva has only one way. His way is in each moment, to express his nature and his sincerity. We say railway track, but actually there's no such thing. Sincerity itself is the railway track. The sights we see from the train will change, but we're always running on the same track, and there's no beginning or end to the track. Beginningless and endless track. There's no starting point, no goal, nothing to attain. Just to run on the track is our way. This is the nature of our Zen practice. But when you become curious about the railway track, danger is there. You should not see the railway track. If you look at the track, you'll become dizzy. Just appreciate the sights you see from the train. That's our way. There is no need for the passengers to be curious about the track. Someone will take care of it. Buddha will take care of it. But sometimes we try to explain the railway track because we become curious if something is always the same. We wonder, how is it possible for the Bodhisattva always to be the same? What is his secret? But there is no secret. Everyone has the same nature as the railway track. There were two good friends, Chokai and Hofuku. They were talking about the Bodhisattva's way and Chokai said, even if the Arhat, an enlightened one, were to have evil desires, Still, the Tathagata Buddha does not have two kinds of words. I say that the Tathagata has words, but no dualistic words. Hofuku said, even though you say so, your comment is not perfect. Choke asked, what is your understanding of the Tathagata's words? Hofuku said, we have had enough discussion, so let's have a cup of tea. Hofuku did not give his friend an answer because it is impossible to give a verbal interpretation of our way. Nevertheless, as a part of their practice, these two good friends discussed the Bodhisattva's way even though they did not expect to find a new interpretation. So Hofuku answered, our discussion is over. Let's have a cup of tea. That's a very good answer, isn't it? It's the same for my talk. When my talk is over, your listening is over. There's no need to remember what I say. There's no need to understand what I say. You understand. You have full understanding within yourself. There is no problem.